Welcome, ladies. Good morning. We are so happy that you're here this morning. Last week, you got to meet one of our online leaders, and this morning, you are going to get to meet one of our in-person night class leaders. So Ellen Humphreys, come on up with me. Ellen has a wonderful story to share with you. She loves gardening, and if you love gardening, you are in for a treat this morning. Well, you're in for a treat no matter what. Come on up, Ellen. <laughs> Thank you. It's an honor to be here with y'all. <laughs> okay, good fruit come to those who plant. At heart, I am not a patient person. My husband can attest to that for sure. Years of living has cultivated some patience within me. In addition, I love to garden flowers, herbs, and some vegetables. I do claim the name Plant Lady because I have multiple plants in my home as well. Um, a non-negotiable when it comes to gardening is patience. When I sow a seed, I cannot expect it to germinate overnight. It is a long process of cultivating, then transplanting, and nurturing. Once I transplant my seedlings in the ground from the germination tray, that soil must also be good. Um, and from there, it's patient watering, more sunlight, wading, pinching back, fertilizing, fighting pests, and more watering. Several months later, the coveted bud or fruit appears. <clears throat> I've seen many spiritual applications in gardening. For example, the parable of the so sower has become more alive to me. Jesus explains the different types of soil in Matthew 13, 18 through 23. He says, the seed sown along the path hears the word and does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches it away from his heart. As for the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and receives it with joy, yet he has no root and endures for a while, but when troubles come, immediately falls away. The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and proves unfruitful. But as for what is sown in good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it, and bears fruit a hundred, sixty, and thirty-fold. Did you know with zinnias and dahlias, it's wise to cut off the first bud deeply into the plant? It crushes me to do so every time. However, the first pinching causes the plant to bush out, growing more branches, which means more blooms. Last spring, I sowed zinnia seeds on March 13th in germination trays. I painstakingly nurtured them in the trays for a month, transplanted them in the ground, and it was not until June 13th, or 12th, excuse me, that my, uh, they were allowed to bloom because remember, I had to pinch that first bud off. As a result of planting seeds in good soil, I had flower buckets of many harvests throughout the summer and the fall. The same is true for my cucumbers and herb garden. I enjoyed and shared these delicious cucumbers and basil herb sauce all summer and fall. Spiritually speaking, we can plant scripture in the good soil of our hearts by reading and devotionals, but as you all know, richer fruit comes by memorizing, studying deeper those life-giving scriptures, coupled with prayer application and allowing God to transform and prune us uh, is deep cultivation of our souls. When hard seasons come and the winds and storms of life blow, it's that spiritual cultivation that sends our roots deep to withstand difficult times and eventually produce fruit. To take this analogy further, on a visit to a vineyard last year, the vine dresser explained that the first grape prune of the season is when the grapes are very young. The vine dresser will prune 30% of the grapes off the vine 
in the first pruning. So the remaining groups will, grapes will receive more nourishment. Pruning may seem hard for the moment, but it produces a richer, tastier crop. Do you see the spiritual application here? The Lord often prunes what is good in our life for the better. And Hebrews 12, 11 says, For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. For the last three years, I've also had a passion vine. I love this particular vine for various reasons. The plant was given the name passion vine and passion flower because the flowers are said to represent the crucifixion story as the flowers are a royal purple with its various parts seen as a symbol of Jesus' scourging, crowning with thorns, and crucifixion. There's a bee on this one, if you can tell. Um, and this, the stamen is in the shape of a cross. Isn't it an amazing symbolic flower? I just love God's creation. Another reason I like this passion vine is that it attracts the gulf fritillary butterfly with its beautiful orange wings on its top side and speckled white wings on the bottom side. They lay their eggs on the vine, the caterpillars eat on the leaves, and they make their cocoons on the vine as well. I've observed the butterflies and caterpillars over the last few years, but last fall I was able to find a well-hidden cocoon. Of course, once I found the cocoon, I checked on it daily in hopes I would see the amazing transformation of a butterfly. That beautiful day came. I observed, took photos, and wondered in awe of God's creation as the butterfly took flight. It flittered all around me. It was just a simple, childlike, miraculous joy. In my prayer time that morning, I thank the Lord for various blessings in my life, from small to large, for nurturing me in nature as I had been in this very difficult season. Over the winter and early spring, my passion vine went through a difficult season as well. The water, water, weather took its toll and the caterpillars were rapidly devouring the leaves. However, as much as it pained me to see the vine weakened, this is one instance that I would not remove the devouring caterpillars because I knew that God created the cycle and beauty would come. In the January freeze warning, the, this plant lady moved all her plants indoors, including the passion vine. I did what was necessary to nurture the plant, the funny thing is, from the move indoors, I discovered one remaining caterpillar. And guess what it began to do? Make its cocoon right there in my kitchen. <laughs> Even in the dead of winter, this caterpillar survived and was determined to fly. Once the freeze lifted, I moved my plants outdoors and thought the worst was over. Even though I watched that kitchen-made cocoon hatch into a beautiful butterfly, I quickly realized multiple caterpillar eggs hatched. And this leaf that is in the picture has probably five little mini caterpillars on it. And um, at one point I counted 30 caterpillars devouring my beloved vine until it was stripped of all life except the vine itself. Now I really wanted to step in and save my poor naked vine. I protested to my husband and he encouraged me to wait out the process. So I waited and fertilized in hope. The spring winds and rain weeded out the many caterpillars and the ones that survived began to cocoon. My hope was renewed that my vine would survive and they would stop devouring. I recently read a sign on a business that said, from winters come wisdom. And Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So good fruit come to those who plant is the title of this devotional. If I had not planted a few seed, tiny seeds, I would not have produced more fruit of patience. 
nor enjoyed multiple harvests of blossoms and cucumbers and herb sauce, and I would not have discovered the transformation of the Gulf fritillary butterfly whose habitat is on the symbolic passion vine. Just this week, I took a photo of my vine flourishing with new growth, and I anticipate new blooms soon. You may be praying and waiting in the season. Maybe you feel stripped of all life and, and uh, any fruit. Continue to plant seeds of patience, which is a hard one. Uh, but plant those seeds of trust and surrender to the good soil of Jesus. Remain rooted and grounded as Paul prays in Ephesians 3 that we have studied. And now allow the spirit to cultivate growth and fruit in you. And maybe a little bit of pruning. <laughs> Rest assured, God will not only bring fruit, but he will bring many beautiful truths and transformations along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. That was beautiful and a great start to our morning. You ladies are dismissed to your core group. We will see you back here in a bit. Well, good morning and welcome. So glad that y'all are here today. We have a lot to go over today, um, especially up front, some announcements, so I'm just going to dive right in. Um, our children have a great lesson. They are learning about when Jesus rises up to heaven and it, he ascends to heaven. Now, Jesus appeared to his 11 apostles and he told them to preach the good news of salvation and he promised that he would always be with them. And then he ascended into heaven and um, now sits at the right hand of God. It is a beautiful, beautiful lesson. And the kids are learning that God wants them to tell others the good news of salvation just as the apostles did. So they're learning all about heaven this morning and how much Jesus loves them and, and talking about who Jesus is to their friends. So... Um, we want to thank Lynn Taylor's group for serving back there. Um, we needed every hand back there because our children's program is full this morning. So thank you all for serving um, when it's your week to serve. Um, just a quick note about registration. If you have not registered yet and you plan on being with us in the fall for our study of Matthew, you need to get it, get it together register y'all because um, especially if you plan on bringing children in the fall our children's program is just exploding and so we know that we will be on a wait list for our children's program and we will most likely be on a wait list for our um, grown-ups program so go ahead and get that done and just tick, tick that off your list of things to do so I encourage you to do that so here we go I hope you have your calendars because I'm going to start ticking off some dates because every date that we're together for the rest of uh, this semester is a big one. Okay, so next week, big, big week, Visitor's Day week. So on the 23rd, which is next Tuesday, we'll have Visitor's Day at our, both our online groups and our West Houston Church of Christ group, which meets at 7 o'clock. If you have questions about that, um, just come and ask me about it. And then on the 25th, a week from today, we'll have Visitor's Day here uh, at Second Baptist. So I hope that you are planning on bringing friends or family members or co-workers or whoever you think will benefit from the study of God's Word, which is everybody. Um, and we don't need to have an RSVP for the adults, but if... Your friend is planning on bringing children because they can bring children to participate in our program that day. We do need to know about those children that are coming, so we'll make sure we're expecting them and we'll have a place for them. So um, you just need to contact Lori Witt, our coordinator, find her afterwards, and get her those children's names, okay? So that's a big day. That's next week. Then the next week, May 2nd, is our children's program, and that's going to be at 11 o'clock. All the kiddos will be standing right here. They'll be singing their praise songs. They will be um, reciting their memory verses for the year. And it is really the highlight of the spring. And it is such a wonderful, wonderful time. And, next, and that day on May 2nd, two weeks from today, will be our children's last official day of programming. It will be their last day that they will be with their children's teachers that they have been with all year. Okay? And then the week after that is our share day. That is the last day we'll be together until the fall. Um, share day for our Tuesday classes, May 7th. 
Um, and then share day for this class on Wednesday, May 9th will be our final day. And like I said, there will be no regularly scheduled children's program that day. We will have limited babysitting. Oh, Thursday, oh, sorry, Thursday, that Thursday the 9th, sorry. Um, we will have limited babysitting that day. So I encourage you now, if you have a child that you bring on Thursdays, try and find alternate babysitting for that day. Maybe get a neighbor to watch them or see if your husband can do a little remote work that morning um, or see if a grandparent can watch them. But if you can't find anyone to watch your child, we don't want that to be an excuse for you not to come to that important, fun, last, final day of, of our year. So we will have limited babysitting available that day. And um, next week, um, on Thursday, if you have a child in the program, you will receive an email from Becky Camp, our, our children's director, and it will have a QR code. We'll have that next Thursday, and you could just scan that QR code. There will be 40 spots for child care. First come, first serve. When it's full, it's full. Okay? So get on it, ladies. That'll, that will be next Thursday to register your child. Okay? So, I think that's all the scheduling things. I have one procedural thing I want to share with y'all. Um, sadly, in the day and age where we live, security matters, even at churches, have to be addressed. And you may have noticed this morning, Second Baptist has very wisely implemented some a little bit uh, string, more stringent security measures to keep us all safe. There's a school here now. They want to make sure everyone remains safe. And so on Thursday mornings when you come, all those lobby doors that go out into the parking lot, they are going to, all of them are unlocked until 9.45, okay? If you get here after 9.45, and I'm not naming names, but I know some of you get here after 9.45, and that's okay. We just want you to be here. Then just come through the porta cache doors. Those will always be unlocked, the porta cache doors, okay? But other than that, they are just going to lock all those other doors just for security purposes and make sure we're all safe, okay? Okay. Um, I think that's all my announcements. Now I get to get to the good stuff. Okay, I'm so excited because tomorrow I get to go see my grandkids. For the first time in a long time, it has been way too long since I've gotten to hug the necks of Sam and little baby Harper. I just cannot wait, and you can rest assured, I know y'all are waiting anxiously to see pictures of my grandkids. I'll have a bunch next week to share with you. Um, I will overflow with, with pictures of the kids. But as I've been preparing for this trip to go see them, I've been reminiscing about Sam and how quickly he's grown up. It seems, I, I don't know where the time has gone. Um, he is five now, and he will go to kindergarten in the fall, which is just crazy to me. Um, it seems like yesterday he was just toddling around and learning to walk. And I was finally remembering as I was getting suitcase out and starting to pack, I, I was remembering some of the times that one time in particular that we went over to visit them. They lived in Florida at the time. And my son-in-law, Nick, was going to go out and mow the yard. And so he went and sat by the back door and he, they have a big bucket where all the shoes go. And he dug through and found his yard, nasty yard shoes and he put those on. And so Sam went over there and dug through the bucket and found two like mismatched Crocs, you know, put them on the wrong feet, of course. And he follows his daddy out into the yard. Nick goes out in the shed to get his lawnmower. Sam goes over to where all of his outside toys are and digs through and finds his Fisher Price, you know, bubble lawnmower. And he just followed his dad up and down the road through the entire backyard. He thought he was mowing the yard just like his daddy was. Sam was imitating his father. And he imitates his dad because he loves his dad. And he admires his dad. His dad is his hero. And when he grows up, you, you ask him today, what do you want to be when you grow up? My daddy. I want to be like my daddy, is what he says. And that's what kids do. They imitate their parents, right? This morning, Paul is going to extrapolate that point. He's going to pull it out and say that we are God's children. And we should imitate our daddy, our father in heaven, right? He's going to remind us that we are beloved children of God, and therefore we should imitate and act like him. We are no longer children of darkness, and so we should not be acting like the world, because that's not who we are anymore. Paul will specifically tell us that we need to imitate God by walking in love, by walking as children of light, 
and by walking in his wisdom. So the challenge for you and I as we go through this lesson this morning is are you imitating and acting like the world or are you imitating and acting like God? And will you choose to imitate God? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much that you have given us these beautiful scriptures to apply to our lives. Let us be women who do follow after you and who look to you as our hero and we just want to do everything to please you and we want to do everything like you do. Father, let us be women who imitate you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we've all heard the saying, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, right? I think Paul may have been thinking about that as he opened chapter 5 because this is what he says, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So when he says imitators of God, Jesus, because Jesus is God, right? What does, he, what does it mean to imitate? It means to mimic, or another word would be to mime. We think of a pantomime, which are kind of creepy. But, uh, but it, it means to mimic or to copy or to model, to follow an example of someone else, right? And Paul uses the word imitate in the present tense, which means it's not a one and done. It's a continuous imitating of God. It's not that we are righteous one time and then, okay, I'm done. No, it's a, a righteous living continually through our lives, right? Now, most of us are familiar with um, the Louvre M Museum in Paris. Some of you have been there. Arguably one of the most famous museums in the world. And it houses works by Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Vermeer. I mean, many, uh, all the masters have works in the Louvre, right? But I thought it was interesting. I read that since 1793, the Louvre has encouraged aspiring artists to come into the museum and to sit and copy and imitate the works of the masters. Some of the most famous modern artists have done that, and they have become better painters, better sculptors, by imitating the techniques of the best in the world. Paul instructed us to be imitators of God, and so like the aspiring artists in the Louvre, we need to keep looking to God, learning from God, studying God, watching God, and asking for his help. So we need to copy the master. That's what Paul is calling us to do. But that brings up a question, how can you and I, who are flawed, finite human beings, how are we supposed to imitate a perfect and infinite God? How, how can we do that? And Paul says it all starts by committing to walking in love. And Tracy did a beautiful job teaching last week, and she uh, shared with us that the Greek translation of that word walk means to live or a lifestyle, right? So we imitate God when we live a lifestyle of sacrificial love. And then Paul shows us the best example that ever lived of sacrificial love, and he points out Jesus Christ, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So Jesus is our ultimate example of walking in love. This is agape love that Paul is talking about here. It is an unconditional, sacrificial love. This is a kind of love that's not based on feelings or emotions. This is truly a love that comes from the indwelling and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the, we are empowered by the spirit who lives inside of us, and then we have to activate that by personal choice. So every one of us who are believers have that sacrificial love living inside of us. That's what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. But we as individuals have to make the choice to activate that and use that and allow that to come forth from our actions, right? Jesus walked and lived a lifestyle of sacrificial love, even unto death. But I think it's important that we understand that Jesus didn't lose his life. He gave his life. He gave his life as a sacrifice for you and for me. And with love, there's always going to be sacrifice. There's always going to be a cost associated with this kind of sacrificial love. Now, 
we may not be called on to show sacrificial love by giving our physical life. Now, maybe that is God's plan for your life. But for most of us, probably not having to give our physical life to show sacrificial love. So what does that look like in our life to give sacrificial love? Well, it means dying, but not physically, dying to self, dying to our selfish needs, and, dying, and allowing ourself to serve others and giving ourself to others. Walking in love is a selflessness that is so antithetical to the teaching of the world because the world will teach you it's all about you. You're the most important. Think of you first. You, you, you. But that's not what sacrificial love is. That's not how Jesus lived. Sacrificial love is a love that prioritizes Jesus first and then others and then ourselves last. And so the first and most important point that we're going to see today is when Paul says be imitators of God. Well, God is love and so therefore we are to walk in love. Live a lifestyle of sacrificial love. Paul's now going to go on and remind the believers in Ephesus that you no longer belong to the darkness. So stop living like you belong to the darkness. Because you belong to God and God is light. And you need to live in that light. If you're going to be, uh, imitate God, you should walk as children of light. Now, light and darkness are common themes throughout the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. And I, it got me wondering, I wonder why there's, that theme is used so much. I think it's because we can, as human beings, we can all relate to the disparity between light and dark, right? We can understand that. It's a, it's a great illustration. So I'll share with you a recent experience I had with that disparity between light and dark. So when Tom and I go to Georgia tomorrow to visit our daughter, it's literally to get to her house. She lives in a small little rural town in southwest Georgia. It's planes, trains, and automobiles to get to her. It is not easy to get to her. So tomorrow we'll take a flight and go to Jacksonville, Florida. Then we rent a car and drive two and a half hours, okay? Uh, now tomorrow the entire trip is going to be done in the, dark, in the light of day because we have an early morning flight. However, when I went to see her when Harper was born back in October. I went by myself. Tom was not coming for another week. And so I went by myself and I had an evening flight. And so the entire trip was in the dark. So I got off the plane in Jacksonville, made my way to the rent car place. And the rent cars at the Jacksonville airport are in a very well lit portion of the garage. It is bright lights and everything's great. So I get to my car, pop the trunk, throw my suitcase in there, climbed into the driver's seat. I, this is a car, a make, a model I've never been in before. Totally unfamiliar, had no idea any of where the buttons were or anything. So I kind of familiarized myself with the car. First thing I did was plug my phone in to get my navigation going because that was very important. Then I adjusted the mirror, did the seatbelt, all that kind of good stuff. Looked around, got a lay of the land, knew where the radio was, all is good. Let's go. So as my car emerged from that very well-lit parking garage, the darkness of the Florida night swallowed me up, y'all. It was dark. Were my lights on? And I could tell that there was illumination, but it was very dim, and it only went out 20, 30 feet out in front of my car. And I thought, well, well, it's probably because around the airport there's so many bright lights, and maybe it's just hadn't kicked in yet, and so once I get away from the airport, it'll get better. Not the case. By this time, I was miles away from the airport and still struggling to see. I could tell that there was illumination out there, but it wasn't good. I couldn't see the cars in front of me. I mean, I just barely, I mean, barely see that column right in front of me. But I kept driving. Occasionally, cars would go by and honk. An 18-wheeler started flashing his lights at me. And I'm thinking, these Florida drivers are nuts. <laughs> it was a struggle. And frankly, I was scared. Okay, I kept imagining worst case scenarios, you know how that goes. I grew more and more confused as to why these lights aren't working, why can't I see? This is crazy, and my anxiety began to get the best of me, and I'm working myself up into a tizzy, right? I should have stopped, but I'm so stubborn. I didn't, and I just kept driving. Two hours and ten minutes into my two and a half hour drive, I see red and blue lights in my rear view mirror. As if the night wasn't stressful enough, now what? And the officer comes up to the car and he goes, ma'am, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, I have no idea. 
And he said, your lights are not on. And I said, wait, no, no, my lights are on because I can sit there. And by this time, I've worked myself up and I'm crying. And I'm like, but I can see like 20 feet in front of the car. The rental car puts showed me a lemon and this is terrible. And they, I'm going to have a word with them when I get back to Jacksonville. And he said, it's a rental? And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, do you mind if I reach inside your car for a minute? <laughs> no, go ahead. And he, he reaches in the little lever on the steering wheel. He turned the knob on, off for the lights. Oh, y'all. <laughs> Suddenly there was light and clarity and the heaviness disappeared. I could see to my daughter's house. <laughs> um, it's, it really is a miracle that I didn't get in a car accident. Um, I felt like an idiot, but I was so thankful that he took me from the darkness into the light. And that's what walking with the Lord does for us. It takes us from walking or driving in darkness to walking in the light of Christ. Paul addresses some of the behaviors, the specific behaviors of darkness um, that come natural uh, to those who are walking in darkness. And he specifically talks about some sexual sins and some impure sins. And what we need to remember is that when Paul is writing this, this in this Roman Greco uh, time of period of the world, it was filled with pagan idolatry and sexual immorality was not only condoned, it was normal, okay? It was just normal. I mean, you name it, it was okay. And it was tolerated and that was normal. And it was things that would make your skin crawl, okay? So when Christianity came and shined a light into that darkness, imagine the hope this gave to the believers. Paul is saying, you have been called out of darkness into the marvelous, marvelous light, and it is beneath the dignity of any believer to be associated with that kind of darkness. It is believe, beneath the dignity of a believer to operate as the world operates. And then Paul says that you can be sure that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. And y'all may have had a, a question about this. Does that mean that I, I could lose my salvation? Absolutely not. That is not what Paul is talking about here. We need to understand that forgiveness is always available to those who come and repent and turn away from their sin. Look at, we, we talked about David earlier in the year, right? And that's a perfect example. What Paul is referring to here, though, is the habitual, unrepentant sin that a person is pursuing and chasing after, okay? Okay. But here's, if, if you are a true believer and you have truly accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, something has changed in you. Something needed to have changed in you, right? And so you stop chasing that sin, but the sin doesn't stop chasing you, does it? It keeps chasing you. And so we've got to remember that when you, we receive Christ, it's not an insurance policy uh, for us. It's a heart change. It should, something should change in our heart, and we no longer want to pursue that sin. But this, when the Spirit of God does come and live in us, that doesn't mean we are exempt from temptation or we are exempt from sin. Absolutely not. It just means that when we do, like Tracy talked about last week, pick up those old dirty clothes and put them on, we need to take them off as soon as we feel that conviction from the Lord and go to him and confess it and repent and turn away from that. But what Paul is talking about here are those who say they are believers, but are habitually pursuing sin. And if someone, if you have Christ living in you, I don't believe that's possible. If you are listening to the Spirit, that you can habitually pursue sin. So that person might need to determine whether they are a true believer or not, okay? So, verses 6 through 8, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were darkness, and now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. Now, it's important that we understand that back in Paul's days, there were some in the church who were teaching that oh, you can go, yeah, you're a believer, you've accepted Christ, you can sin, and 
God's grace will cover that. And you know what? As a matter of fact, you sin all you want. Sin more and more. His grace will come more and more. And Paul beautifully refutes that foolishness in Romans chapter 6 when he says, no, 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 that, that, that is not true teaching, okay? Paul is saying, don't buy into that kind of deception. And this goes back to the maturity and knowing God's word and what it says and what it doesn't say, okay? So Paul expands on the disparity between light and dark and he says that expose the unfruitful words of darkness that are done in secret, the light exposes what is hidden in the dark, doesn't it? The light of Christ exposes what's hidden in the dark. And for us, it's easy for us to hide things in the dark, hide them from other people. I'm going to get on an airplane tomorrow and I will probably forget to take my six, I always put my six ounce face cream in my carry-on bag. You're allowed to take three ounces, right? And so I always get to the airport and I think, oh no. So I put it through and I'm like thinking, oh please don't. But the light of the x-ray machine exposes what I have hidden in the dark of my suitcase, right? So I'll go, be going to CVS once I get to my daughter's house. But light always exposes what is hidden in the dark. And Paul says, walk as children of light, allowing the truth of the gospel to expose what is hidden in the dark. And I, it reminded me of a story that Jesus told in John chapter 8. A story of a woman who had been caught in adultery. But the story really wasn't about the woman caught in adultery, was it? He was really talking to the Pharisees and the scribes, the hypocrites, who were standing there chastising her for her sin when there was so much sin in their lives, right? And so he exposes them. He exposes the darkness in their own lives. And it's so interesting, the very next words after he tells that story are John 8, 12. And Jesus says, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So light reveals God, but light also exposes what is wrong. Ladies, we are no longer children of darkness. And that first Easter morning, when Christ rose from the dead, that, that was the dawning of a new day in this world. And Christians are no longer sleeping. That's why he, he quotes that passage, awake, O sleeper. We are no longer sleeping. We, are, um, we are, have been raised from the dead through faith in him. And the darkness of the grave has been passed by. And we are now walking in the light of salvation. And salvation is the beginning of a new day. And we ought to live as those who are walking in the light because we are no longer in the darkness. And so this brings us to our second point. Be imitators of God. God is light. Therefore, we are to walk as children of light. And finally, Paul says, if you want to imitate God, you need to walk in wisdom. Verses 15 through 16. He says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. So let's just break that sentence apart a little bit. He says, "Walk, look carefully. Which means to look so that you don't stumble. The Greek word really means precision or accuracy. This is how we need to look when we walk, our Christian walk, right? The opposite would be to walk carelessly, right? And without regard. Ladies, we can't leave our Christian walk up to chance, that's just the truth of the matter. We need to make wise decisions and continually seek the will of God. Paul is telling us to walk intelligently, not to walk in ignorance. And he says right there, he says, make the best use of time. And another translation says, make the most of every opportunity. And in that translation, the word opportunity translates to um, a port, making your way into a port. And so it suggests that a ship taking advantage of the tides and the winds to make the, take the best opportunity to get safely into port. Sadly, I know that there are many times that I don't take advantage of all the opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I reason, oh, well, it's not the right timing and it's, yeah, she might reject me or um, I'll share with her next time we get together. Next time. But what if there's not a next time? Lost opportunities may never be regained. They might be gone forever. I think this verse 
is, might be one of those carpe diem statements in, in the scriptures. Seize the moment. Seize the opportunity to share his light in this dark and evil world. And as he further implores us to walk in wisdom, he says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I think too many believers have the idea that trying to discern God's will, well, it's very mystical and I really need to go about It's very difficult to discern God's will and maybe he'll write it in the sky and i got to figure it out. I think that's dangerous and I think that's, I'll be honest with you, I think that's lazy. We discover God's will when we allow him to transform our minds and we allow him to transform our minds through study of his word, through prayer, through meditation, and through worship. I got I to gotta tell you, you understand his word and you'll understand his will. It's not that hard. Understand his word and you'll understand his will. God gave us all great minds in here. He wants us to use them. So whatever you're, you're trying to figure out, what is God's will in this situation? Gather the facts, examine them, weigh them, and pray and read his will. Because his will will never contradict his word. That's a fact. Okay? So our final point, be imitators of God. God is truth. Therefore, walk in his wisdom. My grandson, Sam, imitates his daddy. Like most children do, they imitate their parents, right? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Paul reminded us this week that we are his beloved children. And therefore, we are to imitate God. Are you walking in love? Are you walking as children of light? Are you walking in his wisdom? Will you choose to imitate God? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these scriptures that you've given us. And I thank you that we have someone worthy to imitate. Let us be children who imitate you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.